Okay, so now I'm recording. Um, okay, let me go back since I uh, have to start the recording. So. Yeah, why is my doc showing up? God, get out of there. Close your eyes, I'm just going to get dizzy. Okay. All right, so we had the Gothic facade, Giotto, the sort of precursor to Brunelleschi in terms of uh, representation and uh, depth and perspective. Is the interior of Santa Croce with the pointed arches, so you see the Gothic elements in it. Uh, this, the uh, ceiling, very different from the French and the English. Brunelleschi, father, you can say he is the first of the Renaissance architects and artists. Uh, this is a demonstration. So this this um, picture, so what Brunelleschi did to prove that perspective works, that it is an effective system, he made a, uh, a it was a painting or a drawing, I think it was a painting of a building in Florence, the baptistry, and he drilled a hole where his vanishing point was, that point of convergence for the um, edges of all of the things that recede from you. And he looked through the he looked through the hole. He held a mirror in front. So when he looked through the hole, he could see the, the painting in the mirror. He was holding two of these things. But he was also standing in front of the building. And so he would take the mirror away and he could see the building. And then he put the mirror back and then he could see the painting. And it caused, so he could kind of see whether or not it actually was actually was accurate to what he was looking at. That's what that pick that's what that um, illustration is. Um, so here's a drawing. So um, yeah, Brunelleschi. So a drawing. So like the you know drawing it using linear perspective, it creates convincing a convincingly real image as we see things. Human vision works this way, where as things get farther away, they seem to get smaller. And they get smaller in proportion to, you know, in proportion, especially if it's the same like a colonnade that are, all the columns are the same distance apart. When you see them at, in you know, the depth of them, they seem to get closer together as they recede. So for the linear perspective allows you to reproduce that illusion of depth. Things don't really get smaller as they recede. I'm pretty sure. Um, and so here's an interior of the built church of Santo Spirito. And um, so here you can see the difference between Gothic and Renaissance with the semicircular Roman arches. All right, Santa Maria del Fiore. Um, this big dome, this the world's largest masonry dome that Brunelleschi figured out how to build. Um, and... Um, you can see the scale of it with the people up at the top, up there at the base of the lantern. And so that 1296 to 1436 is because it took 150 years for Brunelleschi to come along and be able to build that dome. So you see the scale of it is massive. It's attached to, well, here's like a these hoists that he developed uh, to Placed large blocks of stone up to build to um, to build the dome. The um, they in the nave, like at the in the in the like it's, I guess it's the um, the intersection of the transept and the nave, or like right at the base of the dome when they were building it. They had like ox oxen, just like a big you know like 
cross with oxen attached, you know, hooked up like um, harness to it, and they would just drive this um, hoist. Okay, so here's the facade of Santa Maria del Fiore, which is a Gothic church originally. Very beautiful. As I have said, I love the Italian Gothic. Here's the interior with Gothic features such as the pointed arches and the rib vaulting. Much lighter, you see these um, like you know um, plastered and painted surfaces that you don't find in the French Gothic. Yeah, and the interior of the dome with a fresco, with a very like elaborate and. Um, you know, it's an elaborate fresco painting of the Last Judgment and other, you know, they, there's a lot of surface there for, um, for the painter to work on. But Last Judgment was a very uh, popular, very popular theme. Keeps people in line when it's like, okay, don't, don't, you know, be a good person or you're going to hell. Um, that's convincing. You don't want to suffer eternal torment. Okay, so this the um, Hospital of Innocence, designed by Brunelleschi. So there's this arcade with it, the arcade or a covered walkway, which has the colonnade. In the Romanesque, it's a semicircular Gothic. They would be pointed, and the triangular pediments above each of the second-story windows is a classical element that goes back to the Greeks, which was also like picked up by the Romans. Here are these little medallions of Amorini. Amorini are little like cupids, pu uh, puti, which are little, like just like they're little babies. Um, sometimes you see they looks like they're uh, uh, bandaged. Um, it's a hospital. Um, You'll see them often with wings, and the uh, they're kind of like a like a they become like the, the in the Renaissance they really like get kick it into high gear with these little guys and they uh, really just like use them to embellish uh, you know paintings like they're in the background or they're kind of like hanging around watching you from inside the painting um, you know often. Pretty delightful stuff. Here is a capital from the column, one of the columns of Hospital of Innocence, and this is a, um, it's like a, um, it's a Renaissance era Corinthian capital. So the Renaissance reproduction of classical architectural vocabulary. Okay, um, coffered ceiling that um, sort of like a waffle grid that has the like um, dip, sort of like um, like little like rectangle like square cavities up there. Um, often you see it like in like like beam ceilings, you get this coffered ceiling where they're like much deeper. Um, but so here, this is um, um, yeah, it's it's like it's another example. This is this is Renaissance. You know, if it if it looks Roman and it's after it's like you know in the fifteenth sixteenth century, it's Renaissance. And so, you know, when they do, like, they, when they, you know, revive all of this, it's not the same as the Romans, because that's, you know, that was centuries before. And what we're going to see is the, like, the Renaissance is the first, like, resuscitation of the Greeks and the Romans. And then it's just going to, it just kind of keeps happening periodically, you know, like in, um, the um, 18th 18th century, um, which is 
you know, coming maybe two weeks, uh, you'll see what is called neoclassical. And it's the French and the English uh, reviving the revival and uh, using creating furniture, architecture, and interiors that are kind of like a more another modern interpretation of the Greeks and the Romans, and then also the Egyptians. Depends on you know which country, which leader, which architect. Um, but you know, there's always some mixture. Sometimes, like you know, uh, Napoleon, um, his preference was to combine Roman and Egyptian. Okay. So here is a um, facade of a um, by the of uh, church by the architecture the architect Alberti. Um, he's the one who actually wrote down what uh, Brunelleschi demonstrated about perspective. He like wrote he was the one who kind of like credited for putting a, a lot of the stuff that happened in the 15th century into writing. So here um, you see this Renaissance facade resembling a Roman building with triangular pediment, curved arches over the windows when, and alcoves and entrance, pilasters with composite caps. So a pilaster looks like a column, but most of the time is not structural. It looks like a col like a rectangular column embedded in the wall, but it's really more it's really more for like to make the exterior, like to make the facade more interesting. There are a lot of things in design that are, are done because they look interesting, not because they need to be there. The building could function without, you know, without those. Um, so, and, you know, it's a, you know, pilaster capital, um, I, the way I, you know, people often like to set, like, probably just to set to like separate columns and um, pilasters. Columns have capitals, pilasters have caps. If you call it, if you call it a capital on a pilaster, I think you'll still be correct. Um, I'll know what you're talking about. Okay, so here is a comparison with San Andrea and the Arch of Constantine, which was a triumphal arch built for the Emperor Constantine during the Roman Empire. These were, you know, like tributes to successful, um, you know, successful emperors. And there are a lot of, you know, different uh, triumphal arches around uh, in uh, Italy from Rome. And, you know, even like in Paris, there is the Arc de Triomphe, which is a, a more modern structure that was just recently covered with um, some sort of like um, fabric or something. It was a, uh, the artist, artists uh, Christo and Jean-Claude that had wanted to do it and they'd done drawings of it. And so the French finally did it. But the Arc de Triomphe is kind of like a you know, it's, it is a sim is a it is a symbolic structure in Paris, but it's not. It's from um, I, well, it's it's not it's 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 later than this period, definitely. Okay. Here is the interior. So this is the interior of this church. And you can see they're just, they're getting bigger and brighter. And the treatment of ornament, this is extremely different. So, you know, this is like uh, 1472, uh, almost 1500. And um, this is like, there's sort of, there's, at, by this side, like, they're getting like, you know, like really like getting into like the late, they're getting almost into the like heading into the later part of the Renaissance here. Um, the churches get more spectacular and larger, more heroic and, um, you know, just the celebration of what they have uh, been able to, um, 
you know, bring back from this long lost age. So this looks much more ro like much more like these, you know, big old Roman buildings. Uh, it's an older picture of San Andrea. And so in Mantua is, is the city in Italy that it's in. You can see like the all like the light that that dome brings in. Nighttime it's going to be dark. You know, especially since they had, you know, they had, you know, they had candle and torch power when these when these um when these were built. So limited lighting. So you can see the um acceleration of scale from Brunelleschi's San Lorenzo to Alberti's San Andrea in, you know, just like within the same century. Okay, so um, central plan churches. Uh, this is, I showed you this, this, this church from Ravenna, which is um, more of like a, has a, a Byzantine church. But you can see this like circular format Okay, so uh, geometry, the, um, you know, bringing back like more like technical geometry and understanding of uh, proportion as the Greeks and the Romans applied it was part of the, um, you know, I think one of the, one of the important things that they did in this period of time. Um, you may, are you, has anyone, um, Familiar with this drawing? Have you? Yes. Like the proportions of. Uh, yes. The proportions of human beings per like. Yes. I mean, can you see from this what this is meant to express? So the the Greeks had you know the Greeks worked out like um, certain aspects of geometry that were that could be observed in nature like a the, um, a uh, a golden section spiral that is a mathematical proportion and then you can see it in a conch shell or a pine cone with the way certain things grow progressively out from a center in a curve and create a spiral. Uh, there is this, you know, going back to the Greeks, there is this um, connection between nature and geometry that a lot of them, a lot of the, like, you know, Leonardo da Vinci was very interested in applying to human proportion. So here with this uh, male figure, standing with his legs straight down like underneath him and his arms out he fits approximately you know he fits inside a square when with the standing spread eagle his navel is the middle of the circle and his arms and his hands and feet will just touch the edge of the circle um it's a bit creative um, everybody doesn't look, you know, everyone doesn't have exactly the same proportions. Uh, but it's a very, you know, it's like a general thing. I mean, it's an interesting thing. It's like, I guess this is a, it's an example of how science and mathematics became more important and how they became applied in this period of time. This is a, this is, this is a difference between middle ages and modern. And one of the reasons why, you know, something that's this, you know, a little more than 500 years old and is considered to be, you know, this is like the part of the beginning of what we would call like what is called the modern era for the uh, really the Eurocentric tradition. So here. Um, so some churches were built with a central a central plan. And you can see these are like often just like overlapping geometry of circles and rectangles, circles and squares.
Okay, so St. Peter's. Hey, what are you doing? Come here. Okay. Mm, so cute. He won't take no for an answer. Um, okay, so here. Your name's off. Right, so Saint um, Saint Peter's in Rome. This is the it's like the home church of the Pope, and uh, you see the uh, you know 1506 to 1626. It took some of these churches took a long time to to finish, and they started. So Michelangelo was um, involved in this one. So here is a uh, plan of St. So this is Bramante. You don't, won't necessarily need to know all these people, but Bramante, plan of St. Peter's, you can see that it has a relationship to the to this. And different architects tried different plans for it. But all of them, they're really kind of beautiful, symmetrical, except for the um, the Antonio de Sangallo. So even just like this is, um, I think there was an appreciation for geometry in plan. So here is the uh, interior, a little bit of the um, finished church of St. Peter's. And this is uh, work of Michelangelo. So these, and of course, you know, um, Michelangelo didn't do this by himself. He was the master of a studio. Um, like even just like with the painting, you know, you have the um, studio master was the the person in charge and um, directed all the work and did all of only the most important work. So like in a a fresco painting, Michelangelo might paint the hands and the faces, and then his, um, you know, the um, apprentices, the, the other, like the other painters who were almost as good, probably as good as Michelangelo, they did all the rest of the stuff. There were specialists that painted clouds, landscape, um, you know, specialists that painted the bodies. So it was a very um, hierarchical, and, you know, when these guys were sent into those um like a painter's workshop they would go in like as like a kid like maybe like 12 or 13 years old and they would be apprenticed to a painter or a sculptor and they would just learn the you know, they would learn the craft from the ground up okay so here this um there is some um examples here of this technique trompe l'oeil which is another french term it is a manner of painting used in the Renaissance and in ancient Rome to create the impression of, to create the impression of realistic scene and real and like convincing depth on a flat wall. So the flat wall, like you can see these figures on either side of this of this um, a hallway, the entrance to the hallway. Those are painted on. That's not sculptural. You can see there's like distortion. Um, in some of them where they look like you'd have to stand in a certain, only in a certain spot on the floor to have the illusion work. Okay. Um, palladio or uh, palladio to be more accurate to the Italian. This is a, um, so this is like getting into the very, like the later part of what's called the Renaissance. This is the Via Rotonda near Venice. So 1566, um, the, and that's uh, you know, like this plan of St. Peter's 1506. More geometry for the, um, for the plan. And you know, he was looking at the Pantheon this is a kind of like a little like mini version of his own like pantheon. And, um, you know, the classical sculpture all over it is, um, to me, to my modern 
sensibility, it's a bit much. Looks a little trashy, but um, I would love to have seen it in the original. You know, you can see where it is worn. So it's, I mean, it's really nice to have some of these buildings still standing and, and largely, you know, like very well intact for the you know, for how old they are. But you can see it has the same like that Roman, uh, like the stairway up the front, like a Roman temple. Uh, there's adding some of these like little like um, porthole windows up in the um, in the uh, pediment. But it does, it is, you know, it's, it's like kind of like um, he combined like residential architecture and the Pantheon. And, you know, here, uh, Thomas Jefferson, his estate Monticello in Virginia, uh, you know, the, 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 um, these, I, the ideals of the, uh, like, the Renaissance and then the, which sort of like, sort of set the stage for the Enlightenment um, also had a lot to do with some of the, the, um, the ideal, the ideals behind, um, the, like, early, like, establishment of the United States. So this is, um, actually, this is, like, you know, the, the, um, the Via Rotunda is, like, a precursor to that, uh, Jefferson House and then, um, just more, um, you know, it's, it's a it's a distant connection, but it's definitely there. Okay, drawings. Here, um, this little mini temple, which I rather like. Um, do we have that? Yeah. So this is a. Um, <clears throat> the round this so there's this round temple in the Roman um, Forum Boreum. The it was uh, it, it was used it was for a long time called the Temple of Vesta, but that was um, proven to be wrong. Um, and so this like uh, round temple, round church. You know, a lot of the um, a lot of the um, early Christian architecture as you know related back to Rome and um, here the um, you know, there is a there is there is a relationship here the Bramante building is uh, I think really quite nice okay here's a um, this is a, it's a, this is later, this is not, this is like a, well, this might probably be around the same time. It looks like an engraving uh, as a, an illustration of this um, House of Raphael in Rome. Uh, so this, it's a good example of like the different features of a Renaissance facade with these like col Roman, like the columns on pedestals. They look kind of like Tuscan columns from the Capitol. Uh, triangular pediments. Triglyphs and metopes. I did not. I don't think I've used those terms yet. It goes back to the Greeks. You see, like up at the top of the building, above the columns, just below the cornice, uh, which would be like kind of like part of the entablature. There is the like alternating pattern. And there's like it, what what it is is like it's three stones and then a space and then three stones and a space and it's like. And the Greeks often would like fill that space with like a really like with a little bit of relief sculpture. Uh, sometimes they would just, like just, like create a story going along, kind of like a film strip. So that's that's classical triglyphs and metopes. Um, balustrade. So this balustrade. So a um, balustrade is a railing that has, you know, a baluster is just like one little post in the rail, in like a, in a railing. Um, and so a balustrade is a series of them that create a barrier. 
Um, so the balustraded upper floor, rusticated stone used in the floor are contemporary. So um, rustication is a term when uh, stone is intentionally chiseled or cut roughly and used that way so that it looks old or weathered or that it's like got some like you know treatment to its surface that's what rustication is and so i mean it's interesting it's it is like more like it's a um it's a decorative technique that you know and you know with some some older buildings like really like the go back to like roman greek like the greeks didn't i don't think the greeks really did that it's kind of like a roman the thing that, that the romans started here um i mean it's interesting that they they did it because like stuff that's that is like you know older or looks like it's been around for a little while is kind of cool and so sometimes it's like it's a little bit of like um uh, artifice you know just say like well let's just like make it look old it's like it's uh they're distressing it that's that idea has been around for a long time okay a little bit a little last bit here so something that was very important that happened in the 15th century and this is up in uh, present-day germany the printing press uh the printing press um, now, most people in Europe were, were illiterate, like, you know, you know, 95% or more, depending on where you're at, could not read, could not read the, the text of a book. They could, they could understand pictures. And so woodcuts were made to print along with text to, uh, communicate you know, like, uh, to like supplement the message of the book. And, uh, but for those who could read, it allowed uniform copies of books to be produced and then distributed all around, you know, a region. Um, you know, countries were not really formed the way they are right now. So, you know, what we call, what we think of as Germany now, uh, then was uh, a lot of smaller, like, you know, um, kingdoms principalities you know some of them were bigger and like you know like uniform but that it changed constantly so here you see the um these um guys printing the guy on the right here with the two little like um well they're they're like they're leather daubing pads they like tap them onto into ink and make a thin film of ink on the leather pad, and then they go over to the text, like the the type the type, and they just like pop 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 and apply the ink. Now now we do it with a roller, but in those days they didn't have like a like roller to like roll it out. And then they put the sheet down, slide it under the into the press, and then crank it stamp it down raise the raise the press and then pull slide the uh, the bed back out and then take the sheet off and put in you know ink it again and put a new sheet down so you know movable type where they would cast type so that you could like um you know make uniform copies of books by printing them rather than having to have teams of monks write them out uh, which would lead to mistakes, sometimes just illegible books. Uh, it's a much better way and a much more efficient way to produce, um, you know, to produce books and to make them legible and more available. So it was kind of like the internet of the 15th century. It really just like uh, made a huge difference in the communication of information. This is a woodcut that is hand colored from the Nuremberg Chronicle, which was a chronicle of world history according to the Europeans up to that point. So it was a, this big sprawling book. Um, and here is a representation of the city of Nuremberg. 
but these books could be, you know, they were, you could, the nice, the thing with printmaking is you can make, you make multiples, you make an original, um, you know, an original like uh, image cut into wood, and then you can print as many as you can until the block falls apart, which would be hundreds, if not thousands. And here is a uh, printed book from this era with uh, the images, like the text printed from, from metal cast type and then woodcuts set into it. So um, Vitruvia, so, so um, Da Vinci's the Vitruvian man, Vitruvius was a Roman writer that wrote down the, um, like he wrote down, well, he wrote down a lot, but what like he wrote down like the uh, correct proportioning of the classical orders of architecture. Um, and uh, he preserved a lot of what the Greeks did because the Greeks, you know, um, you know, a lot of what they had of the Greeks was like they had to like, they had, you know, stone carved, they had like, like stone carving, some stuff like written on um, vellum or like, you know, like animal skin. But a, a lot of these, a lot of these texts were lost in the Middle Ages. And so uh, one of the biggest moments of the Renaissance was when they rediscovered Vitruvius. Um, and there were like um, a lot of um, the texts were discovered in, um, I believe, I'm going to have to check this, Northern Africa. And there was a lot of, there were a lot of, a lot of these texts that were like uh, translated into Arabic by Arabic scholars and then, then retranslated into Latin or um, the like vernacular languages like the or, like early German, Italian, so that um, they could read them. So one of the, and you know, uh, just onto like what the like what the images could do. Um, the Protestant Reformation was assisted a great deal by uh, an artist named Lucas Cronach who made woodcuts in support of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, um, and it was act very helpful because most people couldn't read like the text they would have no idea like what that says. But a woodcut that shows the Pope riding backwards on a donkey with, instead of his usual Pope's miter, a spiral of poo on his head, um, that they understood. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I was raised Roman Catholic, but I, I don't have a, uh, I'm not taking a side here because neutral to me. Okay. Here's a close-up of this page with hand coloring. So some of it you can see just kind of like the color just kind of dashed on there. Um, but you can see that the consistency of the of the words and that's that's from because it's all printed from cast metal. Okay. But uh, I'm a printmaker, so I got to talk about printmaking. It's uh, tremendous stuff. Okay, uh, we are going to have a break now.